Honorable Prime Minister, item number 15. Mr. Speaker, sir, I rise to join all the members of this August House in conveying our sincere thanks to the Honorable President of India for her inspiring address. Sir, in this 60th year of our Republic, it's a matter of pride for us to have First Lady of the State, a very distinguished woman, and it was our privilege to listen to her inspiring address. Sir, it is also a matter of satisfaction that over the last three days, we have had a fascinating debate on the issues covered in Rashtrapatiji's address. While some of the honorable members have expressed their satisfaction at the performance of the government on many fronts, there have been others who have found fault with us in some counts. This, for me, is the essence of democracy. Democracy is about debate, about argument, and constructive criticism. Democracy is about acknowledging the existence of multiple multiple viewpoints about tolerance for dissent and diversity, about respecting the opinions held by others without necessarily agreeing with them. The debate we have witnessed is in, is in the best traditions of parliamentary democracy. This is what makes our nation unique and makes me hopeful for our collective future. I sincerely hope that we will have more of such debates and less of disruption of the House, which has become a sad feature of our parliamentary performance. Mr. Speaker, sir, as I listen to the various members of this House, I draw considerable satisfaction from the fact that the vision of inclusive growth spelled out in the Honorable President's address is something about which there is almost unanimity on both sides of the House that we need strong, resurgent growth to get rid of chronic poverty, ignorance, and disease which still characterize millions of people in our country is something which is universally accepted. The fact that our growth rate now takes us to the lead of some of the fastest growing economies of the world is a matter of pride for all Indians. Sir, growth is a necessary condition of inclusive growth. But we have always recognized that growth by itself cannot, need not get rid of mass poverty unless there are strategies in place to empower the most disadvantaged section of our community. And the President's address sums up that vision which has guided the work of our government in the last four years. What is that vision? First of all, as I said, we need a strong resurgent growth. First of all, we need growth because to create more jobs. We need strong resurgent growth to get more revenues for the public finances so that we can spend more money on social inclusion, on education, on health, on rural development, in improving rural and urban infrastructure. The fact that the last four and a half years, that four years have witnessed a record growth rate, therefore, is a matter of satisfaction. 
But our government, as our common minimum program itself recognized, growth by itself does not necessarily ensure that the fruits of growth will be equitably distributed. And therefore, it is the duty of any uh, popular government to address that question, to empower the poorer sections of our society so that they can become active participants in the processes of growth. And that's what we have done. First of all, we are all agreed on both sides of the house that we need strong growth in agriculture. We must also ensure that our farmers, particularly small and marginal farmers, do get good remunerative prices, their productivity increases, that they do become partners in processes of agricultural growth. Second, it is also agreed on both sides of the house that in a country where 90% of our people are in the unorganized sector, where the institutions of social security are inadequate, we must maintain a reasonable control on prices because inflation is a tax which hurts the poor much more than the rich. So I think that's agreed on both sides. Third, the The third thing, which I believe also is generally agreed on both sides of the house is that for inclusion, we need that all our children should have the advantage or the benefit of equality of opportunity. It cannot be done overnight, but education is the biggest single means of empowering our children to lead a life of dignity and to become partners in processes of growth. And therefore, we need a strong commitment to the expansion of education, primary education, elementary education, but also a strong commitment to the expansion of the tertiary education because we live in a knowledge intensive world economy. And unless India's tertiary education sector grows in accordance with the needs of skilled manpower, we will be left behind. So that is what the President's address spells out, what we are planning or what we have done in the field of education. Honorable Health Minister, when he was replying to the questions a few minutes ago, listed the achievements of this government in taking the passage of health care to the poorer sections of our society. I am not saying that we have succeeded in reducing the infant mortality rates or the maternal mortality rates to what they should be. This is not a short-term process. It will take time. But the numbers of doctors, the number of nurses, the number of specialists that are now in place I think is much larger than was the case four years ago. So I am convinced that if we follow this process, we will see a distinct improvement in the health status of our children, in the health status of our women. And that is as should. We also know, sir, that in our agriculture, there are large number of landless workers who are very vulnerable. And also, although agriculture offers employment for utilization of labor, there are times in the year when no work is available in agricultural operation. And therefore, we need some mechanism to supplement the employment opportunities to soften the harsh edges of extreme poverty in rural areas. And that's the case for having a nationwide employment guarantee for 100 days that is now in place. I am not saying that this one act can abolish poverty, but if implemented honestly, if implemented efficiently, it can soften the harsh edges of extreme poverty. 
the central government now has raised the minimum wage rate to above 80 ru rupees per day. If work for 100 days is available, each family, even if it has only one warning member, would have an entitlement of 8,000 rupees per annum. And I dare say that this will help to amel ameliorate the conditions of those who belong to the lowest rung of social and economic yet. Sir, also, we all agree that if the fruits of development have to accrue to all sections of our population, it is essential to recognize that the Dalits, the scheduled tribes, and minorities have not benefited adequately from processes of growth. And therefore, we have strategies in place some were there earlier. We have expanded those facilities. In expanding healthcare, in expanding education, we are paying particular attention to the needs of areas which have high concentration of scheduled caste, scheduled tribe, and minority populations. Sir, Honorable the Leader of the Opposition talked about this as the, as the appeasement of minorities. I do not plead guilty to that charge. It is a process of empowerment of all disadvantaged sections of our population. And I take pride in the fact that our government had the courage to recognize that our minorities have not benefited appropriately from the processes of growth. And therefore, the time has come to pay a little more attention to their needs of education, of health. <laughs> If you have anything, if he agrees at the at the end of it, if he agrees, I can take please, 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 please. Sir, Let us at least show respect to the uh, prime minister of the country, as the honourable leader of opposition is entitled to full respect. He is also sir, entitled to it. We, therefore, what we are trying to do is to reduce the inequalities of opportunity, the gap that exists between regions, the gap that exists between classes, the gaps that exist between urban and rural areas. This is a part of the process of empowerment. It is the essence of the process of inclusive growth. And when I listen to the debate, there may have been some problems with regard to the treatment of minorities, but by and large, all sections of this House agree that inclusive growth is the essence of a participatory democracy. It, it is an integral part of the value system that is embedded in our magnificent contribution and the fact that our government has advanced the cause of inclusive growth, I think that is some matter of satisfaction for all of us. Sir, I would be the last one to say that everything is rosy in the garden of it. We have increased allocations for infrastructure, for rural infrastructure under Bharat Nirman. We have increased massively allocation for education, for rural health, for urban infrastructure under the Jawaharlal Nehru Urban Renewal but mission, but one has to recognize the central government can increase allocations. It can give guidelines to states, but India lives in states, and therefore it is the giant responsibility of the center and the states to work in all sincerity to implement the agenda of this inclusive growth that we all feel our nation should be and is committed to implementation. And therefore, today we have a situation that there are various parties represented in this house. They are ruling in the states. So it can be easily said that without more active collaboration and, co collaboration and cooperation 
between political parties in all spectrum of this house, I think we cannot succeed in carrying forward the process of inclusive growth that this country needs. And therefore, I appeal to all segments of the house to recognize the great opportunities that India has. I have often said shortage of resources is not today a problem for our country. We have shown in these last four years how tax revenues can become buoyant, and I compliment my colleague, the Honorable Finance Minister, for that. We have therefore been able to spend a lot more money on education, on health, on rural development. We have also shown where there is a way we can improve the functioning of the public sector system. And I compliment my colleague, the Railway Minister, for the magnificent way he has managed the railway finance Sir, I therefore appeal to all segments of this House that at least when it comes to issues of development, we should forget our party differences. Today, it is possible to abolish poverty in the life of one single generation. If our economy grows at the rate of 9 to 10 percent per annum, then we would be doubling our national income in a period of about seven to eight years. And if, along with growth promoting promotion strategies, we have in place programs for ed improving the educational status of our children, improving the health status of our uh, women, there will be a definite positive impact on poverty. This is an historic opportunity. And we must make full use to realize this vast latent potential of our great country. Sir, I started by saying that all of us are agreed that the interest of our farmers and the state of our agriculture is a prime determinant of whether we are moving towards inclusive growth or not. I will be the last one to say that everything is rosy with the state of agriculture. When we came to power in 2004, agriculture was in a state of distress. We had to restructure agricultural debt both in 2004 and once again for the debt <coughs> districts, distress districts in 2006. Why this has happened? It has happened, <coughs> if you look at the statistics, from 1981 to, from 1980-81 to the year 1996-97, Indian agriculture grew at the rate of about 3.5 percent per annum. After 96-97 and till the year 2003-2004, the NDA years, large number of these were NDA years, the rate of growth of agriculture fell to 2.3 percent per year. When, when, and there was a fall during the NDA period in the share of national income which went into investments in agriculture. Today, our colleagues on the other side talk about the interests of the farmers. I look at what were they doing in providing more incentive to our farmers. During the Congress regime from 91 to 96, the terms of trade improved year after year in favor of agriculture. During the NDA regime, the terms of trade, the prices that farmers pay and far farmers receive deteriorated during the NDA period. And what was the concern for farmers? You look at the procurement prices. The NDA in five years 
increased the procurement prices by a pittance, 50 rupees in four or five years. Look and come look at the record of our government, and therefore I thought I would mention some of this data because Sri Anand Gita Ji referred to this problem. In 1999-2000, the minimum sport price for wheat was rupees 580 per quint. The previous government, that is the NDA government, raised it by rupees 50 in five years at the small incremental rate of 10 rupees. A rise over a period of five years of 8.6 percent only. In the last, compare this with the last, compare please, please. this with the last four years of our government, we have raised the minimum sport price for wheat by rupees 370, a rise of 56 percent in four years. And I expect Mr. Jinsa at least to applaud, I think, this achievement. <laughs> In the case of Paddy 2, we have raised the minimum sport price by 33% in four years as compared to a small pittance of 12% in five years by the NDA government. Gross capital formation in agriculture as, as a proportion of GDP has improved under our regime from a low of 10.2% in the year 2003-2004 to 12.5% in the year 2006-2007. After many years, agricultural growth touched almost 4% last year. Those who neglected the welfare of farmers, depressed the minimum sport prices, and the terms of trade for agriculture, those who exported our those who exported our food Please, surpluses away at a loss have no right to be advocating that they are the most powerful. Mr. Speaker, sir, our government is convinced that India cannot prosper if our farmers do not prosper. I recall from my childhood the words of Oliver Goldsmith, ill fares the land to hastening ills of prey where wealth accumulates and men decay. Princes and lords may flourish or may fail. A breath can make them as a breath has made, but a bold peasantry, their country's pride, when once destroyed, can never be supplied. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, sir, it is the distress of this bold peasantry that brought the UPA to office when the NDA was talking about shining India. Yes. This, distress, this distress is a legacy of the NDA rule, a rule during which policies were anti-farmer, anti-agriculture, low, low minimum support prices impoverished our farmers. Mr. Dinsa should know it. <laughs> they, needed, they needed a fresh flow of credit. The tripling of agricultural credit flow by us did not address the problem of past debt. The debt relief we have now announced is our attempt to finally remove the burden of the NDA period from our farmers' shoulders. We are determined to end agricultural distress. We will not stop till we have wiped the tears from the eyes of all farmers. That, that, Mr. Speaker, is why our government took the historic initiative to waive farmers' loans on an unprecedented scale. A debt relief scheme of this magnitude has never been conceived on and it has never been conceived or attempted before. It is an income transfer on an unparalleled scale. If bankruptcy is permissible form 
of business in outcome in industry. What is irrational about this yes. waiver? Yeah, yeah. It, will, it will allow a fresh flow of institutional credit to farmers. It will clean up bankers' balance sheets. It will stimulate economic activity in rural India. And I don't make any apology for this. The finance minister. This is not right. Listen to him if you have any comments to make. This is not fair. This is not fair. Listen. No, no. no listen. Under my jail. Please. This is not fair. Please. Uh, this yeah, let him reply. He is entitled to reply. Budget to Ara, budget may have no bullying. Take a budget may bullying. A budget may bullying. Please, please, this is not. Show respect to the show respect to the Prime Minister. Please. You cannot. I'm not by Jay. When you raise it, you raise it in the budget. That was done in the budget. You raise it in the budget discussion. You are going to speak. You see, you should raise it in a proper manner so that there may be a reply. Please don't record anything. Don't record except the prime minister. Unless he concedes, nobody is. Mr. Speaker, sir. Ab bait jaye and ab kaj. Bait jaye, nothing is being recorded. Kya ho raha hai? You are disturbing your prime minister. Mr. Speaker, sir, the finance minister has mentioned that the total cost of the debt relief will be around rupees sixty thousand crores. This covers all scheduled bank, commercial bank, regional rural banks and cooperative banks. It covers both production and direct investment credit. It is not just about non-performing asset, it is also about overdues. And it will benefit about four crores farmers. The debt relief will be a simple exercise which we will complete by June. It will not be a long drawn out affair. I agree that there will be farmers outside the pale of institutional credit who do not benefit from this waiver. For them, we have operated since 2004 a program of financial inclusion so that each and every farmer has a bank account and is able to access institutional credit. Honorable members would remember that in the two year 2004, Nearly a month after we came into office, we adopted a scheme under which those farmers who are indebted to money lenders can swap their debt by going to the commercial banks and substitute the debt of money lenders by institutional credit. That scheme still operates, and many thousand farmers in Andhra Pradesh have taken. Yeah, hold on. Mr. Anand Kumar, this is very unfortunate. No, I won't allow. Don't record anything. Nothing will be recorded. No, this is not fair. This is not fair. You can't have a running commentary now. No. Sorry. Sorry. No. Please take. Please take. Please take your seat. Please take your seat. I request this is not fair. You cannot go on asking me questions. No, please. You reply. You this is, please take your seat. Please. Don't do that. Don't. He has not conceded. He has not yielded. He has not yielded. Nothing is being recorded. Don't record anything. No. What is this going on? You can go on making running questions here. No, I won't allow. Ablo Sit down, Mr. Atawar. Ablo Bajaye, na.
आप भी बैठ जाइए I request the honourable members on all sides. At why are you talking? You cannot ask questions like that. You are here for long. You do not cannot ask questions. Then the prime minister will end this speech. What is this going on? It's very, very unfair, Mr. Anand Kumar, I can only say. You sit down, please. Please sit down. What is it? You sit down. Don't stand there. Why are you shouting there? No. Mr. Speaker, sir. This is, this is the way I am very, very sorry. It's a very sad moment. He will not go on answering your questions. No, you have no right to ask. No, not in this manner. Not in this manner. No, no, I don't consent. Think I go on shouting. Go on shouting. Yes. This is very unfortunate. Mr. Athawale, I will will you sit down? Will you I will ask you to go out. Very well, they can't. Up by Jayana, Mr. Baba. Yes, yes, Prime Minister, please. Continue. Please continue. Mr. Speaker, sir. Matter of great sorrow. Matter of great sorrow. Of our gesture shows our commitment to our farmers, our determination to improve their lot, and our desire to see agriculture restored to its rightful place in the Indian economy. Sir. Mr. Adwani and some other members have asked, where is the money going to come from? Oh. Doubts have been raised about the resources required for this write-off. Before I answer that, let me remind the leader of the opposition that what we have done is nothing more than picking up the unpaid distress bills which the NDA government had left behind. Yeah. I would, I would like to assure the honourable members of the, this House that this package will be well funded. Whereas farmers will see the benefit of the relief package immediately, banks will be compensated as and, one, as and when the loans become due. The details are being worked up. I believe that the dues to the bank, including production and investment credit, will materialize over a period of three to four years. We will make adequate provision from tax and non-tax revenue over this period to fund this package. Let there be no doubt that the banking system will not be constrained in any manner and there will be no contraction in liquidity. As the finance minister requested this house, we need the unstinted support of the entire House to help implement this decision. We should not grudge farmers their due. Mr. Speaker, sir, several members refer to the problems of inflation. I do agree that it is the bounden duty of any government in this country to worry about inflation if the rate of inflation exceeds the limits of tolerance of four to five years. I would like to submit to this August House that our government has worked 
sincerely to contain the rise in price. Compare the background, the environment with which we face. When the NDA government was... Yes, please. The Honorable Prime Minister's observations will be taken down. Others, without leave, would not be added. Mr. Recorded. Speaker, sir, I was merely describing the background of why inflation rates differ from one period to another. When the NDA government was in office, the international prices were all time low. We came to office in 2004 and the oil price per barrel was $36. Today it is close to $100. The NDA maintained a modicum of price stability by depressing the prices payable to our farmers. We do not follow that. This is very strange. Are you, the, what, what are you doing? I'm appealing to the leader of the opposition. This is not the right thing. Mr. We are not sir, behaving. We, we are committed to reasonable price stability, but we will not be a party to maintain so-called price stability by neglecting the prices that ought to be pay payable to our farmers at a reasonable rate. Our commitment to reasonable price stability should be obvious from what I am going Please, to say. Please, what are you doing? The prices of petroleum products have more than tripled in the last four years, but we have not increased the price of kerosene we have made only a marginal addition to prices of diesel and prices of petrol. We have not changed in these four years the prices uh, payable by our farmers this is very unfair. for their fertilizer. Then nobody will be allowed here to speak if they disturb. What shall I do? What in, can I do then? You the, always object if somebody raises question. In and the, then you, you will not reciprocate? No, you are saying you are wrong. Mr. Speaker, sir, in these four years, despite rising costs, we have not changed the prices payable by our farmers for fertilizers. We have not increased. <coughs> we have not increased, despite paying. This is very, very just. I do not know how you want this house to function. One of the most important debates of this uh, parliament system, parliamentary system, on which reply is being given by the head of the government, you are not prepared to listen and go on making running commentary and asking him to explain to you every sentence. This is not the way to function in this house. If you don't want to hear, I will request the prime minister to conclude. Simply, they cannot dictate. Mr. Speaker, sir, we have paid Please. handsomely is running commentaries prices may be to our farmers. But as a measure of our commitment to the welfare of the weaker section, we have not changed in these last four years the prices payable under the public distribution system, either by people above the poverty line or people below the poverty line. This is an unparalleled record, I think, which cannot be had. So this itself should be a convincing evidence of our government's deep and abiding commitment to the welfare of the weaker sections of our community. The House has my assurance that we are committed to maintaining reasonable price stability despite an adverse international environment. Today, commodity prices are rising. Today, prices of imported vegetable oils are skyrocketing. 
prices of imported food steps are increasing, even then we will make adequate, effective measures to ensure that our weaker sections of our population are not hurt by this adverse winds coming from abroad. Sir, Mr. Adwani referred to the Women's Reservation Bill, and I should like to comment on that. It's a matter of deep regret to me that we have not been able to move forward on this front. Our government's commitment to the reservation of seats in state legislature and parliament, there should be no doubt about that. We have made, in the last three years, efforts to evolve a broad-based consensus. The Honorable Leader of the Opposition knows some of the consultative mechanisms that we have adopted. We have not succeeded, and I admit that this is a commitment in our common minimum program. Now that the Leader of the Opposition has offered his support, now that our CPM colleagues have offered support, I, I, will, I, I, will, I, I, I will make once again another attempt to evolve a broad-based consensus so that we can move forward on this front as soon as possible. ठीक है ठीक है ये आप प्लीज डोंट रिकॉर्ड इट नॉट टू बी रिकॉर्ड इट नॉट टू बी रिकॉर्ड नॉट टू बी नॉट टू बी प्लीज साइलेंस इन द हाउस साइलेंस मिस्टर स्पीकर सर श्री अल्के एडवानी एंड सम अदर मेंबर्स raised issues of internal security. Advani ji has made some critical references about our government's performance in dealing with terrorism and terrorist groups of different kinds. I have no intention to score points against the opposition on this issue. National security is too serious a matter for any kind of political one up -benching. I would like to assure the South that our commitment in the fight against terrorism is absolute. India has remained in the crosshairs of terrorists for a long time. I do not need to remind the South about a dark day in 2001, when but for the fact that fate intervened and our vigilant watch and ward staff, our parliament would have been the scene of a great deal of bloodshed. I am not scoring points here against the failure of the NDA government. I only wish to remind members that we have a dangerous... We, we have... What else? Silence in the house. Silence, silence. Silence, please, please, please. I only wish to remind members that we face a dangerous enemy in terrorism and that we must maintain a constant vigil to prevent terrorism from <coughs> succeeding in its nefarious design. Some honorable members, and Shri L.K. Adwani, wanted details on the progress made in some of the recent terror attack cases. In the Mumbai blasts, which he referred to, 13 persons have been arrested. In the cinema blast in Ludhiana, 10 persons have been apprehended. Arrests have also been made in the Rampur attack on the CRPF camp and in the UP courts blast. Mr. Speaker, sir, I can detail many more cases. I can give details of attacks that have been filed, including one on the RSS headquarters in Nagpur. Our government is resolute, as indeed any democratic government should be, in defeating the forces of extremism and terrorism. Our multifaceted strategy has produced significant results. In Jammu and Kashmir, there has been a significant decline in terrorist violence and an upswing in economic and political activities. Sir, 
I wish to state that the battle against terror will be a long drawn out one. We strongly believe in zero tolerance of terror. Some members have said that we have provided an easy legal regime for terrorists. This lie must be named once and for all. Legal regimes do not prevent terror. If that had been the case, there would have been no attack on Akshar Dham or on the Raghunath Men. Draconian laws could not prevent the IC814 hijack. In fact, the signal that went out in this case was that if the terrorists were determined enough, the government would merely succumb to them. We had the shameful sight of the then external affairs minister as calling dreaded terrorists to the street. Mr. Speaker, sir, sabre rattling does not prevent terror. It requires efficient, effective policing and intelligence gathering. The morale of our security agencies is high, and we will ensure that they are adequately equipped to meet their challenge. I should say a few words about some matters of foreign policy. Our foreign policy has sought to promote an environment of peace and stability in our region. The challenge before us is to create an external environment that is conducive to our long-term and sustained economic development. We want mutually beneficial relations with all our neighbors, with all major powers, and with all our economic partners. It is with this perspective that we have engaged the world and sought partnerships across the world. So I should say a few words about the civil nuclear energy cooperation with the USA and other countries. We continue to make efforts to make this possible in a manner in which, in, in which we can maximize the use of nuclear energy for peaceful purposes. We are presently engaged in negotiation with the International Atomic Energy Agency for an India-specific safeguards agreement. We also continue to seek the broadest possible consensus within the country to enable the next step to be taken. I believe please, that please. such cooperation is please. good for us, for our energy security, and for the world. Mr. Speaker, sir, I was very happy some days ago, the former security, national security advisor, Sri Brajesh Mishra, coming out openly in defense of the nuclear cooperation agreement. Also, sir, we have seen in this country Mr. Straub Talbo, who negotiated on this issue with the NDA government, saying that if NDA government was prepared to swallow even 50% of the deal that they were I will not stop you at the appropriate time. Do it. At the appropriate time, Kiji. Abhijaye, Mr. Kalmadi. At the appropriate time, you. At, at the appropriate time, you do it. No, that will not go in. That will, nothing. Don't take any. Yeah, bully. Mr. Speaker, sir, I should say a few words about our policies towards our neighborhood. Our top priority remains our neighborhood. We want peace, stability, 
and prosperity in South Asia. I want to begin by congratulating the people of Pakistan who have shown that like us, they want to choose the democratic path. I am sure the House will join me in conveying to them our warmest good wishes as they consolidate democracy in that country. A great daughter of Pakistan had to sacrifice her life in the process. We mourn with profound sadness the death of Benazir Bhutto. The people of Pakistan have paid their tribute to her memory in their own way. Sir, I would like to assure the newly elected leadership in Pakistan that we seek good relations with Pakistan. India wants to live in peace with Pakistan. The destinies of our two nations, I have often said, are closely interlinked. We need to put the past behind us. We need to think about our collective destiny, our collective security, our collective prosperity. In their first pronouncements after the election, the leaders of the main political parties in Pakistan have also spoken of their interest in developing close relations and working with us to bring about a durable peace. Indeed, the dialogue we have resumed with the government of Pakistan over the last few years was started when the late Benazir Bhutto and Sri Rajiv Gandhi were prime ministers. The most courageous steps to build peace were taken by Prime Ministers Nawaz Sharif and Atal Bihari Vajpayee. We have continued the process with President Bushar. I have said before that I have a vision about the future of India and Pakistan. I believe that in both countries, there is a consensus that we must have close and cooperative relations and a framework for enduring peace. I hope, sir, that the newly elected leaders in Pakistan can quickly move forward with us on this. I am sure that this house will want me to say that we would welcome this and meet them halfway. Mr. Speaker, sir, the Honorable Leader of the Opposition said that this government is a faceless and directionless government, that it needs to be determined and decisive. I do not understand the context in which our government is being decorated with such colorful objectives. <laughs> I one yeah, also predicted that our government will not complete its full term. This is not the first time he had made such predictions. He has been proved wrong. And to him, I would like to say, na khanjar uthegi, na talwar chalegi, ye bazu mere azmai hai. English for people like us. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, sir, the direction in which we have moved the country in the last four years is well laid out in the Rashtrapati's address. It is in the direction of inclusive growth. It is in the direction of empowering the poor, marginalized sections of society. It is in the direction of unleashing the enterprise and creativity that is inherent in every citizen of this great country so that he or she can live up to their full potential. It is in the direction of taking everybody along and working to eradicate poverty, ignorance, and disease. It is in the direction to enhance our citizens' security. I hope the direction is now clear to all partners. Of course, I am aware that some members have been wishing that this government falls, and this has been their wish since the day we came into office. 
to their misfortune and to the good fortune of the nation. This has not happened. <laughs> But su such fond dreams do not die easily. Therefore, they continue to see visions where none exist. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, sir, the future beckons India. I seek from the leaders of all national parties a long-term vision that will enable us to widen our development option. I seek a commitment to the nation's best long-term interests. Let us not divide ourselves by adopting <coughs> narrow perspectives on important national policies. It is in this perspective, it is this perspective that informs the President's address this year. I am therefore happy to express my sincere gratitude to Rashtrapati <coughs> for her address to Parliament. Yeah. 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 Yeah.